is CB8 Speaks, monthly program of Community Board 8 of Manhattan. Community Board 8 of Manhattan encompasses the Upper East Side and Roosevelt Island, and the Upper East Side is defined by East 59th Street to East 96th Street, East River to Fifth Avenue. And this program is designed to help the community understand the issues of our area. And we've decided to do a new series of programs to interview longstanding members of the community board and get some of their memories and thoughts about working on the board and about the community. Tonight's guest is Barry Schneider, who is a past chair of Community Board 8. Barry has been dedicated to the Upper East Side and his causes for many, many years, and we're very happy to have him here tonight. Barry, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you. We're going to get started, actually, some newer topics before we get into some of the experiences you've had. We're going through a period of the pandemic, a uh, year and a half into it. And how have you been dealing with the pandemic yourself? Personally, I'm of an advanced age, so I'm being very, very careful. Uh, I wear a mask. Uh, I was inoculated early on, uh, waiting eagerly, waiting for the, the booster shot to come in later this year. And my wife and I, uh, we've been married 55 years. We are very careful about sharing our space. We have not dined in a restaurant. We've not had a close association with many people. Uh, we just feel that's the best. And of course, there's always radio, there's a TV, there's Zoom, there's your phone, there's your cell phone. And we, we've kept up with our friends and family through phone conversations and Zoom meetings. Yes. You mentioned that you've been married for 55 years. How long have you been living in the Upper East Side? We moved in in, in our current residence in 1967, and we've been there ever since. Uh, it's, uh, it's the first condominium in the state of New York. It's called the Saint Tropez on East 64th Street. And it was across the street from a very famous restaurant, I believe. That's correct, yes. Uh, with, with, there are a number of them. The original Fridays was across the street, mm -hmm. and just to the north was oh. Maxwell's Plum, yes, yeah. yes. What a beautiful restaurant. Yes, when our son was young, we would dine there frequently, and one of the waiters knew magic. And a, a four or five year old doesn't have a hell of a lot of attention span, but with the, with the fellow doing magic, Andrew just loved it. He, was, he, he, he ate, ate, ate all his food, including the vegetables. That's really funny that, to hear that was a family-friendly restaurant because I remember it had kind of a two-level step-up. Right. And if you had the table at the up, upper edge, you could look down on the bar and watch people doing pickup lines. That's right. <laughs> uh, I have a, a story about that. Um, my wife and I were there for dinner with a, with a good friend of ours, friends of ours, a man and wife. And while we, uh, he and I were getting our coats, our wives were waiting to, for us to return, and they got hit upon by two. <laughs> that, my wife came home with me that night. That, I, I just have to say that. Good. You've been with Community Board for how many years? 30 years now. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Uh, any other groups that you've worked with? Just before I joined Community Board 8, uh, a group of us on the Upper East Side in the area formed a neighborhood association called the East 60s Neighborhood Association. Uh, the, the association, our association, uh, took form because of a problem we had with a particular vacant lot at the corner of 63rd and 2nd. Um, we wanted to, be, to reflect what the community wanted in that space, not just what the landlord who happened to be the, metro, the MTA wanted in that space. And, uh, we formed the association, we had elections of officers, we could en 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 engaged members, and then we did indeed engage the folks over at the real estate at M MTA, and uh, instead of putting in a parking lot, which is what they wanted, which would be a horror because of the traffic in those days, uh, and, and going through to, to today is, is, a, is a real problem at 63rd and 2nd, mm -hmm. the traffic coming off the FDR Drive and the traffic going south on 2nd Avenue to the Queensboro Bridge. And so we prevailed upon them to take a look at other options. And uh, lo and behold, after a number of months of, of work and, and uh, petitioning, um, the MTA decided to, to, hide, to lease the space to a outdoor garden, sculpture garden. It was called the Elizabeth Street Garden. And they put in a beautiful pool and they put grass down, seating areas. It was an incredible improvement for the neighborhood. So we said to ourselves, if we could do this, we could probably do a lot of other good things in the community. And so that's how we were, were formed back yeah, in 19. That Elizabeth Street Garden, I remember it so well. So uh, anybody listening who 
um, or watching have had not rem do not remember when you're seeing a, a garden center. It's not like what you see in the suburbs with pinwheels and you know little potted plants. No. These were massive statue statuary. That's right. Uh, it was like a, a museum's. One thing about the the garden, while they had these massive sculptures for sale and they were being sold, none of them were either delivered to or picked up from the garden so that there wasn't a lot of traffic generated by the sale of these uh, these items. Uh, so it worked out very, very well. We we're very, very pleased. Yeah. And so we moved on to other issues uh, in the community. And one of them was uh, we realized that our voice needs amplification. And one of the ways to do that was be to join another organization like the Community Board, which represents, as you pointed out, a large area on the Upper East Side. And it's, it's, a, it's a city chartered agency. And we figured one of us uh, who formed the association should try to become a member of the, of the community board. And the other member would be the president of the association. Well, I volunteered to try to get membership onto the community board. And, and I was appointed in 1991. This is my 30th year there. And it's worked out just fine. Yes. Thank you for your service on the board. Thank you. Um, and uh, getting back to E60's Neighborhood Association. so. Um, you do a lot of uh, work there. I know they, uh, you have a lot of committees. Um, and the what's the website? Esna-nyc.com. Right, and you have a lot of committees. People can look up, uh, see what they can work on. When the pandemic's not raging, I know that, that your wife Judy's out there pruning trees with the team, right. removing graffiti. Correct. And, and actually, she's helped in my building where she enabled us to get a hold of some paint, even though everything else was in lockdown, we were able to do some graffiti removal on my block, thanks to your your wife and your organization. We also uh, have a street fair, which is coming up on September 25th, just a week from today, on 60th Street between 5th and Madison. We've been doing that for about 28 years now, and we, we get a chance to meet the public and meet the visitors to New York and tell them what's going on here. Yes. Uh, in addition to the street fair, we have a clothing drive, uh, we also do a uh, uh, toy drive at, at the holiday season where we collect toys and, and games for the children at the New York Presbyterian Pediatric Unit. We have a carol sing. At that point, we collect the, the toys and games. Again, with COVID, we didn't do it last year. We're not going to be, doing, be able to do it this year, but we shall make a contribution to the pa pediatric unit. We'll give them funds to buy gift cards, which they then give to their patients' families to buy toys and games for the children. And those are some of the things we do. No, very busy organization. Yes, we are very, very strongly committed to the merchants in our community. Every two years, we put out a 72-page booklet listing all the uh, enter commercial enterprises uh, in the district. And um, at the beginning of the COVID, when the lockdown came, we called all our merchants to see what they were doing. We put out a new directory summer newsletter of the Neighborhood Association, it's called Esna Extra, just came out. And again, we list all the, the new merchants who are coming into the area, which is terrific, and also the, the merchants who have been here, how they've adjusted to the COVID uh, issues. Yeah, and you recently had a online forum, I guess. And welcome to this special edition of Esna Extra, a virtual meeting of the board of directors featuring Betsy Pallavi, the author of Walking Manhattan Sideways and in 2011, Betsy had a crazy idea to walk the entire original Manhattan grid from 1st Street to 155th Street. As she traversed the side streets from East River to the Hudson, she had an opportunity to meet each of the small businesses and listen to their stories. The project took nearly six years to complete. She had walked all the streets of New York. That's right. And she um, was there to interview a couple of the merchants in the air. It was a really interesting program. And I learned about these two merchants I've started using. Oh. So, yeah, is it the Padua Bakery? Yeah, Padoka. Padoka Bakery on 67th Street and Frank's Cleaner. Correct. Fantastic. On 65th Street. So, yeah, yeah. so I, I, you know, I had started using them. So, it's a really great resource if people want to find a really, really good quality services is to look at your membership roster of these businesses. Right. And you can find that on our website esna-nyc.com under businesses. Right. Well, that's getting back to the community board. Sure. Because we've got a lot of years to cover there. Yeah. The community board is made up, uh, obviously, of the full board members, but it's, it's kind of, its fuel comes from its committees, and there are a lot of committees. What committees have you served on? 
Uh, well, currently I'm the co-chair of the Parks Committee, and that's why I have a Parks pin in my lapel. Never miss a chance to have a little commercial me message. Uh, I've also been co-chair co of the Transportation Committee years and years and years ago. Uh, I was chair of the Second Avenue Subway Task Force, which I'll talk to about in, the, in a little while. Um, I attend the, mo the monthly meetings of the Street Life Committee, Youth and Education, um, Small Business, Arts Committee. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply involved in the, in the working of the com community and the community board. Mm -hmm. And you were, you were chair at some point. What we're wondering about is what are some of the common challenges faced by committee chairs and the, mm -hmm. and the board chair? I, I was chair from 1998 to, to the year 2000. We have term limits, uh, three years is a max, and then you're out. Uh, but during, then subsequent to that, I was, as I mentioned, chairs or co-chairs of the committee. The, the problems that, that the chair faces is one to, to engage the members of the, of the board in discussion, and, and uh, particularly in the land use and full board meetings, which are, are communities of, of the whole. You find yourself uh, calling on the same people over and over and over again which doesn't lead to a rounded discussion. So uh, when I was chair, I, I made a point of, uh, for one, suggesting people move around the room, don't sit in the same seats every, every month. And then I would call on people who, who haven't spoken recently, in sometimes in, in, as, mad, as long as months apart, so to get, get an engagement of them. And uh, the other issue, very often some of these meetings can devolve into, uh, not fistfights, but verbal, Verbal fights, and uh, <laughs> yeah, it, it's a healthy debate. Well, yes, you know, <laughs> and, uh, nicely put, and that cleans it up very well. I remember w at one uh, event we had a, a balcony full of, of people, and we have a, an auditorium full of people, and it was difficult to, to control the uh, the mob. From that day on, I put a sign in, uh, on the lectern that says civility, and I would talk about it because we're a collegial organization, we should act like it at, at all times. That's a major challenge. And just to keep the conversation going so that you, you reach a conclusion where you get a resolution to the problem you're debating. As the chair, you're also called upon to, I think, uh, meet with the other community board chairs of, around the city, correct? The borough president has a, a monthly meeting called the borough board, where all 12 borough, uh, all 12 community boards in the borough meet uh, at her office uh, downtown. Mm -hmm. And that, that, you, that, that gives you the opportunity to meet the other chairs of the boards and exchange uh, ideas and thoughts. Also the elected, the elected council members are there. So it's a, it's a good or, uh, meeting place uh, to, uh, to, to have your thoughts heard and also to learn what the, the problems of other community boards are. We also have to stay in touch with all the elected officials too. Um, yeah. I because there there are quite a few. That's one of the interesting aspects of going to the full board meetings, getting the elected officials' reports, and uh, you're like surprised at how many um, uh, officials there are representing the the area. And I've always been amazed at uh, how a chair has to kind of keep track of not only elected officials but who's on the staff of these officials. And right. um, I don't know how you would manage that. How do, how do you keep the, the players straight? Well, as a chair, again, I, I was chair many years ago, but it, it, it's worked this, through, through to today. Um, we don't do it alone. Um, the board office is, is a great supportive. Right now, Will Breifel is doing an outstanding job, particularly with the Zoom meetings. It, it's a totally new enterprise, and he's, he's done an outstanding job in, in, uh, in getting it done and keeping it moving. But, and he and the rest of the staff in the office arrange for the uh, elected official or, his, or that representative to be at the meeting and uh, to take their report. It is an amazing organization. Yes. Uh, having been in the board for 30 years, um, what are the long-standing issues that you've seen over the 30 years or uh, anything that has, you thought had gone away and came back? Good question. I'll hit on a, a, a trivial topic, but one that is persistent, and it's bicycles on sidewalks going the wrong way, on the streets going the wrong way, uh, ignoring traffic rules. Uh, there isn't a meeting uh, of either transportation, street life, or uh, other committees that the word bicycle doesn't come up and there's a discussion. So that's been going on for, for years and years and years. Also, w w the issue of building height. 
Um, as you know, if you just look, take a little walk around the Upper East Side, we have buildings of varying height, three-story walk-ups. You've got the uh, 100 and some odd, f f well, they're not quite that tall, but 67, 600, 700 foot towers. And there's been a discussion over the years to limit the height in certain areas with, within the district. We do have a height limit on the side streets called the R8V, where the limit is 60 feet or, or 60, 75 feet if you're a, if a, 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 a hospital or a doctor's facility. Um, but that, that off, often comes up. Mm -hmm. um, what are we going to do about the building heights? And now with the, uh, uh, the climate change being coming f f first hand, that first hand, that people have, have suggested that the tall buildings are, are a hazard to climate conditions. So uh, that's another argument that's being made, which I think is a, is a compelling one. Mm -hmm. That's the alpha and omega of, yeah. of the arguments. <laughs> yes. I would think also traffic. Does oh. that come up a lot? Because I do remember when the leadership of the, the precinct changed, and um, I was at some meeting, I think you were there, it was the, uh, either the community board or the um, uh, 19th Pre Precinct Community Council, and the incoming um, uh, precinct commander or, or one of the officers who was new to the area said they couldn't believe the traffic. <laughs> <laughs> well. Very, very good. No, no question about it. The, uh, um, we've got the FDR Drive. You've got the Queensboro Bridge. With the pandemic changing the way people shop, they don't go to the store anymore. They have deliveries. So you've got UPS, FedEx. Uh, Amazon bicycle uh, trolleys. Amazon, yes, f f uh, Fresh Direct. So there seems to be a lot more commercial traffic, certainly, even though they, the uh, private cars dropped off at the very beginning, and they're, they're back, I think, full, full steam. Uh, yeah, traffic has, has always been a problem, and uh, with the, in, the inclusion now of bicycle lanes, if you have the wherewithal to attend one of the transportation committee meetings, you will hear the discussion of bike lanes on 60th and 60, 61st and 62nd Street, and it's, uh, it's a real problem. And the city has to ad adapt, and it, I don't believe it's doing as much as it can to adapt to the new, the new, the new, new. But we'll see how that plays out. Do you think there are any common issues between our community board and any other community boards in, in well, the city? Well, my wife and I attended the Civilian Police Academy, and uh, I had the distinction of being the valedictorian in my class, and I gave a speech to the uh, cadets, and um, we, we were also asked to, to, to visit other precincts to see what they do. So we went to a community um, a c council meeting in, in the northern Manhattan, and the issues there were dramatically different from what we hear in Community Ward 8. The word traffic never occurred. The drugs and crime were, were the topics that controlled the discussion, um, not, not what we hear in uh, Ward 8. But we have more collegiately, if I, if I may. We have common interest in the Queensborough Bridge with Board 6 just to our south. And over the years, there had been a task force, a joint task force of Board 6 and 8, on the Queensboro Bridge, which I happen to co-chair, uh, and uh, we, we resolved some, some of the problems. It was almost jurisdictional. Uh, I won't go into any detail, but just leave it at that. Things have worked out just fine. And then we have common issues at Central Park. There are five community boards that border the park and are involved in approving or hearing the um, uh, work that's being done and giving our recommendations. If you, uh, the, uh, the East River Esplanade, what we share with the Board 11 no to the north of us and Board 6 to the south of us. So there are a lot of issues that overlap the one community board because of the geography involved. You mentioned the Queensboro Bridge, and that made me remember that uh, you and your wife Judy created a, a bridge centennial? Yes. Can you speak to that? Because oh, that I was love wonderful to. what I, you guys I, did. I, in 2006, Judy and I were having lunch at a lovely Italian restaurant across the street from our house, and out of a bolt of the blue came to me and I said, do you realize that in 2009, the Queensboro Bridge is going to be 100 years old? She said, be quiet and eat your pasta. Uh, I said, but no, I'm very serious. This is a big thing. It's 100 years old. So I stepped out of the restaurant. I called Sam Schwartz, gridlock Sam. I said, Sam, the traffic man, uh, the Queensboro Bridge is going to be 100 years old in 2009. I want to throw him a party. We got together with him, Harold Holzer, whom you know, 
and some other folks, and we formed the New York City Bridge Centennial Commission. Uh, next time I sp spoke with Sam, he said, Barry, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is, yes, the Queensboro Bridge celebrating its 100th in 09, but so are five other bridges in New York City. And one is celebrating in 2010. So we formed the commission to honor six New York City bridges. In Queens, we had a display in the local library and we had parades on the Queensboro Bridge. We closed the bridge down. Mayor Mike Bloomberg was our guest speaker. He came and he sung the Queensboro Bridge song. We stopped that pretty quickly. That evening we met on the Esplanade and we had fireworks in the river. We asked the children if from uh, Ronald McDonald House if, if, if they would join us. And so we had the youngsters from the Ronald McDonald House join us that evening and we had the fireworks, we had refreshments and it was spectacular. We worked on it from 06 to 10. Yeah. That really was an outstanding achievement. Yeah. Thank you. Is there any one achievement related to the community board that really stands out to you? The Second Avenue subway. Um, I, became co I became chair of the committee uh, early on, like 2012, I guess it was, 13 perhaps. Um, and we, I would go to the meetings that the MTA would hold, and I, I, I came away very unhappy. Um, so I said to Judy, uh, I'm going to call Mike Herodotrano. He was the president of Capital Construction at MTA, and just have a discussion with him what's going on. So I got the meeting, and it was down to 2 Broadway. We're waiting in the lobby, and Judy says to me, Barry, what are you going to say? I haven't got an idea. I haven't got a clue. I don't know. But by the time we got left from the lobby to his office, I said, aha. It was one of those aha moments. I said, you've got to hold meetings where the representatives of the community are heard, listened to, and respond and, and treated with respect. So what we turned what turned out that we would have these meetings in large spaces where we'd have individual tables for the, the lo, for for the sites where the subway was coming, 63rd Street, uh, 86, 70 90, second, 72nd, 76, yes. Uh, and uh, that turned the whole issue around. Instead of being lectured to by the MTA, the MTA would listen to what the community board want or the community wanted, and it became a very, very positive approach to a, a very serious problem. I mean, there were in, enormous disruptions in households because of the construction that was going on, the dirt, the noise. Um, we, we spoke with the MTA about minimizing all of these impacts, and as best they could, they did. And the, uh, the uh, subway opened on, on, finally on schedule. It was about 10 years behind schedule at one point. And they had a great big opening on 72nd Street. Unfortunately, I was supposed to be the speaker, but I had come down with the flu. And so I wasn't able to attend. But the subway opened anyway. It's a work of art. They're, they're remarkable. They're clean. They're bright. They're welcoming. They're good. Well, I have to commend you because I, I went to quite a few of those task force meetings, and it helped a lot in getting the information to the community and letting them speak. Because in almost every single meeting, I would come away. It would be like these. I, how do these people just find out? A, about the, the subway because they would come going, no one told me and they're building a subway and it's actually they started to dig. Mm -hmm. But it, it was the forum for a lot of people to come and be heard. A lot of opinions, a lot of concerns. And I, I think it was, it was a great thing for the people who live in the area and especially to know, you know what was going to happen and the accommodations the MTA was trying to make in part because of what the task forces bring to their attention. It was a wonderful opportunity. In addition to having these meetings, I was able to be when they launched the tunnel boring machine and they made the first cut. And then I was there when it came through at the end of the tunnel. came through the tunnel, that through the wall, the wall crumbled and it was a remarkable uh, moment. And I remained friends with Harada Chano and many of the other people, Joe O'Donnell, uh, we speak with him fairly re regularly. It became uh, like a little club of concerned citizens and it worked. It really worked very, very well. 
Over the years, have there been any processes that have changed that you feel made big improvements to what the board is trying to do? Well, in, in a smaller way, but a significant way, um, because of COVID now and something before, we've changed the way we vote in committees and the full board. Uh, we, uh, we have to vote, everyone has to be tallied, they have to be present. The routine had always been call the roll, yes, no, not running for cause, abstain, whatever. Early on, four or five years ago, our chair at the time, Jim Klein, is now the Honorable Judge James Klein, instituted a method where he said, it, where it was obvious it was going to be almost a unanimous vote. And he would say, all, right, all those who, who choose not to vote yes, raise your hand and we'll, we'll call on you and we'll hear from you what your vote is. That was abandoned for a while, but now with the COVID, it's so much more acceptable to do it on a Zoom where you was able to do the tally very rapidly. Yeah. And uh, Will uh, sends out the tallies the next morning, if not that night, so you can check to see that your vote was accurately recorded. Well, very well done, very, very smart people. That, that's one of the, the, a lot of other issues that probably will never be resolved. Uh, but this, I think, made a, a big difference in the way we, we handle our meetings. Yeah, uh, it's, there are a lot of processes that are involved in getting these meetings to cover all the material that's needed in a timely manner. Um, you know, I've been at board meetings that seem to go on forever, and it's always the challenge to get everyone's input, but not to have it go on um, unnecessarily long. What the board has in instituted is a uh, time limit on members of the public who want to speak. We don't have a time limit for members, but we do have for, for members of the public. They have a two minute uh, opportunity. And of course, if it's a very complex and detailed problem, uh, the folks in, from the community can organize themselves and have speaker A, B, C, D, and they can get everything covered in not but just two minutes, but two minutes or four minutes or six minutes or eight minutes. Um, so we're not, we're not stifling discussion. We're just controlling it a little bit. Not a, I shouldn't say control. We're, tickling it a little bit. That's right. I hope they enjoy the tickle. <laughs> now, um, another great thing about attending these meetings over the years, uh, getting to hear some really brilliant people, um, very intelligent, some, some very impassioned people who, um, who are on the board and speak. And um, I, I want to ask you, do you remember um, uh, who you remember the best and what their contributions were? Oh, sure. Because when I first came on the board, I had never attended a board meeting before, so it was all new to me. So for the first several months, I was incredibly impressed with Chris Collins. He was chair uh, when I came aboard, and Chris was articulate, he was bright, he was compassionate, he was all the things you wanted in a chair. Um, he went on to become corp counsel, working for uh, the, the borough president. He worked with the Board of Stands and Appeals. Um, he's, he, he, uh, he's now with uh, Capolino. Uh, PR, uh, we keep in touch. He was a, he was a great guy, and I'm, I was pleased to become a chum of his. After that, we had Warry Price. Warry, after being chair of the board for two years, became the executive director of the uh, Battery Park Conservancy, and she's done a remarkable job there. And uh, while we haven't kept in touch, I do, I, I am be able to follow her uh, on the on through Google, and so she's still she's still doing a great job, very, very proud of having known her. Uh, then two more current uh, members, Hetty White, who left the board a couple of years ago, but Hetty had been chair before I became, before I got on the board. But Hetty was articulate, intelligent, compassionate, fun, concerned about every aspect, not only of the board, but the community at large. She was a treasure, and we've kept our friendship, uh, again, pre-COVID, uh, we would dine uh, with a, gr a group of people, f former chairs primarily, uh, would meet and uh, have dinner. And it was always a pleasure to see Hetty and her, and her husband, Tom, nice people. And currently, we've got Chuck Warren, uh, environmental attorney, great guy. He's also the co-parliamentarian. And we look to Chuck to remind everyone what the Roberts rules are. One of the, one of the things I, I want to discuss with you briefly is we don't, live by Robert's rules, and I think we're going to die by not having Robert's rules function as it should when people are casting their vote, if they're going to vote no. 
It's a one-word answer. No. Abstain. Or, or not voting for cause. That's all you get to say. You don't get to argue your position when you're casting your vote. Now, Roberts rules, without question, rules that out. And our members know that, but they sometimes work around it. And I find it very a aggravating mm -hmm. that we are dragging out these meetings because people don't want to play by the rules. So R Robert's rules, we need them. Chuck's role as fellow in charge of, of rules discussion, we should be honored him for that. And he does a remarkable job as co-chair of the Transportation Committee. I mentioned earlier bicycles. I mentioned earlier bike lanes. Uh, these are issues they deal with almost monthly, and he maintains his composure and his very nice attitude toward everyone. Yeah. He's a model. Definitely. I mean, you, you definitely have mentioned the, the cream, creme de la creme, I guess the phrase is, because there really are a lot of people, and it's hard to... Um, yes. I'm really impressed with the people on the board, because they, they have to be nominated by, um, uh, I guess, a, uh, a city councilman, or yeah. what's, what's the well, problem? Well, 50% are nominated by the city council member. 100% uh, are appointed by the borough president. So you can, be, you can be nominated by the borough president, confirmed by her, or nominated by the council member, and then confirmed by the borough president. Right. So there's a vetting process that, that's involved. Oh, yeah. Even if for people who are, you know, not um, involved uh, that, that deeply or have that much time, but such as myself, I'm a public member, um, where you only need appointment by the, the board no. chair. But, but to be on the board, you, you have to have shown some, some degree of public service. And so that's, you know, why you, you had a lot of these well-accomplished people there. Yeah, not only has shown it, but you, you have to believe it because if you, if you do it right, it can be very time-consuming. I retired from my, my career as an ad agency uh, head uh, back in uh, 1997, just before I became chair of the board, because I found that well, it, it, the, the agency, the business I was in, it was a small boutique agency, uh, was being impacted by the advent of the personal computer. But I won't go into that for any detail, but I'll write you a book on it. But I'm getting more satisfaction of, of working in the community than I am from my business. So I closed the business down and I devoted my, my time and energy to uh, the community board and then to the neighborhood association and to the other organizations that I've joined and participated in uh, over the years. Now your, your, your term as full board member uh, is gonna be ending sometime in the near future. Um, do you think you might stay on working with the board? In well, some way? I will continue to be involved. Uh, you can take the boy out of the community, but you can't take the community out of the boy. I'm the boy in this case. Again, I have the neighborhood association. I have my, my association with uh, some of the, the local hospital, uh, the Wild Cornell Medicine, New York Presbyterian. I'm on the boards there, uh, the community ac uh, advisory boards. Uh, I'll continue with that, um, and I'll continue to monitor what's going on in the community through the community board. Uh, they're a great filter for all the issues that re abound in the community, and they, they, through the various committees, education, street life, transportation, uh, social equity, uh, those are all the issues that are, are in the community, and they put a bright light on them. Now, you've actually inspired quite a few people on the board all over the years about your dedication to public service. Are there any people uh, you would say you've been inspired by? Yes. The, I mentioned one earlier, uh, Mike Bloomberg. Um, I, had known, I had not known him until he ran for, pre for, president, yeah, for, for mayor. But then we invited him in 2004 to be a guest speaker at our annual meeting. And he showed up with him, and he was terrific. And I got to know him a little bit. I like him. What did you find inspirational about him? Oh, no nonsense. No nonsense. You know just where you stand, if, you're, what your position, if it's a position you were taking. He was uh, he's a straight shooter. And you don't often get that in elected officials where they have so many different constituencies they've got to adjust to or respond to or service. And I just, I just got to, uh, I felt good, very good about it. Mike. We met on other occasions when the Wild Cornell Medicine, uh, while uh, Cornell Tech on Roosevelt Island was dedicating uh, the building and named for his daughters, uh, we got a chance to speak with him at, uh, at, as we left. So it, was, it, was, it was good. Things are good. Anybody else that you find inspiration from? Uh, well, you mentioned Carolyn Maloney ah, at one point. Oh, well, yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah Carolyn's, again, single-minded but broad-minded. I admired greatly 
the, the way she dramatized the issue of the first responders to the 9-11 catastrophe, where she would wear the fireman's coat. It must have weighed 50 pounds, but she wore it day in and day out, spring, summer, fall, winter, to focus on the issue of the, the government. We must take care of the first responders who gave of their health and their lives cleaning the pit. She was dedicated to seeing that they do get the care and that they, I believe, is extended to 2092 through her efforts. So, yes, yeah, she's, she's uh, an outstanding public servant. And Henry Stern, I think oh, you mentioned. Oh, old, yeah. old, old Henry Stern. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, you've been oh, working with him on Andrew Haswell Green? Have uh, you been working with him on that? No, no, he, that, was, that came after Henry, mm -hmm. I believe came after his, his, his term. His birthday is May 1, so I would always call him on May 1 or write him a note. Again, I am only Park com Committee co-chair the last couple of years, but I was always involved in Park, Central Park particularly. And so when, when he was Park's commissioner, we had an old, all kinds of interactions with Henry. When he dedicated 24 Sycamores Park uh, at York Avenue and 60th Street, the way he's going to dedicate it, he's going to have the children from the school touch each tree. The 25, I said, thank God it's not a thousand oaks. So he thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> and he, he had his dog with him at all times. And, uh, he gave me a, a pin. Uh, my my park name was uh, Sancho Pay, I believe. But that may have been Judy's name. We hit it off very well. And uh, he, was, he was a great commissioner. Yeah. Although con controversial, yeah. but he, he tipped the scale on the plus side in my, in my book. Well, I, I also mentioned Andrew Haswell Green that yes. you guys have been working with. So, um, how is that going along? Very well. It's EDC is now in charge of finishing phase 2B, which is the green lawn that we've talked about since 2004. Oh, it's, it's been a slog. This is on the, on the waterfront at 60 the 63rd. And it's tremendous. It's so fantastic. Yeah. Well, the, yeah. They, they've got the f uh, phase one with the dog run, and now that's mm -hmm. done. That's been there for many years now. And phase two is the uh, Alice Acock Pavilion, which is Andrew Haswell Green Pavilion. Uh, and now we're waiting for the connection for the East Midtown Greenway coming through the building at 60th Street. We'll tie into the uh, the Esplanade there and Andrew Haswell Green Park. And it's supposed to open next year. I, I just can't wait. Yeah. How the name came about, one of the things I was doing when I was a member of the community, I, be I became the, the district historian for Community District 8. And I met with Mike Michonne. He was a historian at the time. And he was an advocate for Andrew Haswell Green. He was the fellow in the, in the late 19th century who was responsible for the joining of the five boroughs to form the, the city of Manhattan. He was also involved in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the 42nd Street Library, a, a, a wonderful citizen of the city, and he got, no, he got no respect. But through his efforts, Mike Michonne, he spoke with the Parks Commissioner, Adrian Benefee, and they named the park Andrew Haswell Green Park, which I think is a very suitable and fitting designation for this great green space. It is. It really is fantastic. I hope everyone gets down to see that. Well, Barry, thank you so much. This has been so much fun talking to you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us with Community Board 8's series now on the members who dedicated many years to making the Upper East Side and Roosevelt Island better places. Please visit the website for the Community Board, cb8m.com, if you want to see prior episodes of this program. There is a, uh, a link for CB8 Speaks and also this calendar of upcoming meetings of the committees and the full board, which I highly encourage people to either visit on Zoom. We've had, we had one full board meeting in, in person this summer. It's going to be touch and go, may be Zoom for a while more, but it's definitely worth an investment of your time. And this is Monica McCain-Sanchez. Again, thank you for joining us at CB8 Speaks. Good night. Thank you, Barry. It was just fantastic. Thank you.